Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Arthropod Genomics X or AGSX Virtual Symposium Spring 2023. Uh, we're just about ready to get started on session three, the Insect Genome Biology and Evolution. Uh, so you definitely are in the right place. Um, let's see, it's right about the top of the hour. So I'll probably just go again and get started through our introductory slides as people kind of start logging in and get, get themselves settled in for a, a good set of speakers. All right, so this is a joint effort between the USGA ARS, which is the United States Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service in the I-5K, the latter being a genome sequencing initiative um, headed up uh, international uh, uh, aimed with sequencing 5,000 arthropod genomes. And this is session number two, as mentioned previously, uh, genome, uh, insect genome biology and evolution, and is headed up by Dr. Lindsay Perkins. Perkin. Um, this is all made possible by several people working very diligently in the background. Uh, first of all, uh, Kevin Hackney is our national program leader. Um, it has devoted a lot of the support and resources that have made this possible. Obviously, the technical background, uh, one of those being our very important uh, person working on Zoom and the registration pages, Glenn Haynes, as well as the website and Twitter feeds who are run by Anna Childers. And Pia Olson, she runs very smoothly all of our video recordings today and, and the previous, as well as the upcoming uh, session number three. And Rob Waterhouse, who manages and runs the Slack channel. Uh, so I have a little bit of additional information on where to find the resources for these different uh, things that have been set up for your uh, convenience and for you to utilize. Uh, the website uh, has come through on several emails to you, but it's present here already. We have a QR code up top. Um, on the banner if you want to scan that to get a little bit of information about today and upcoming speakers. There is registration for the third session coming up. If you have not already, please go to that URL and do so. All the videos uh, that should be seen today or, or all the recordings will be presented on the YouTube channel. There's a link provided through for you right here. Once they go up on YouTube for all the registrants, we will be sending you uh, a link by email to access. And lastly, there is a Slack channel that's set up. But one of the uh, keys for these, there is a, a first time users must sign up and register. And there's a link, uh, it's valid for 30 days. I believe this is still the active link. Um, it's Arthropod or ATSX Spring 2022. Uh, we probably should update that, but uh, it's still carrying the last year's name on it, but it has all the current information on that. From right now, I will turn the air over to Dr. Lindsay Perkin to introduce uh, the, today's session. Thank you very much. All right, hello. Uh, welcome everyone to the third annual AGSX Symposium. Um, like Brad said, I'm Lindsay Perkin. I'm at the USDA ARS in College Station, Texas, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, this session covers topics on insect genome biology and evolution. And I'm very excited about our speaker lineup today. So all three of our speakers are discussing work that fits under this large umbrella of insect genome biology and evolution. And they're each gonna tell their own story using insect genomes differently to answer specific questions in their particular systems of interest. Um, and you can see on our screen, our three uh, great speakers today. Um, and so without further ado, I wanna go ahead and start introducing our first. Um, but before I do that, Brad has reminded me that if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A. Um, you can see here on the screen, um, it's different from the chat. So please use the Q&A and not the chat function if you want me to see your question. All right, so our first speaker today is Dr. John Sproul. He is assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Uh, John is an evolutionary biologist, and he has interests investigating how repetitive DNA shapes the evolution of genomes and species. Uh, his talk today is entitled Repetitive Elements in the Era of Biodiversity Genome Genomics, Insight from 600 Plus Insect Genomes. <clears throat> and as uh, Pia gets that started up, just uh, another reminder, please use that. Q Hello, I'm button. John I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and I want to first thank the organizers, especially Lindsay Perkin, for the invitation and the support leading up to this point. 
And I also want to thank my co-first authors, Scott Hotelling, who's a professor at Utah State University, as well as Jacqueline Heckenhauer, who is a postdoc at the Sneckenberg Institute and Lowe Center for Translational Biodiversity Genomics in Germany, as well as our other um, our other fantastic co-authors anchored by Paul France and at BYU. I also want to just say thank you, of course, to funding sources um, here up front. I'm excited today to talk about repetitive elements in insect genomes and want to start with just a bit of background on repetitive DNA. And so if we take repetitive DNA sequences in a genome, we could categorize most of those sequences as either being interspersed repeats or tandem repeats. The interspersed repeats are typically referencing transposable elements. So here we have um, a stretch of DNA and five purple transposable elements are, are, are interspersed across that. And if we zoom in on one of these purple transposable elements, we see that uh, transposable elements uh, typically have uh, one or more coding regions, and they encode for proteins that facilitate the movement and proliferation of transposable elements within a genome. We've got to tip our hats to Barbara McClintock when we talk about transposable elements uh, for, for her discovery of them and her Nobel Prize winning work in maize. In addition to transposable elements, tandem repeats make up another big category. And within tandem repeats, satellite DNAs are one of the abundant categories. And uh, these satellite sequences, they're simply repeated sequence motifs. And the sequence might just be a few nucleotides, or maybe it's hundreds or even thousands of nucleotides. And it's simply repeated tandemly, that same motif, um, one after another. And so at one or more locations in the genome, you can have these, uh, these clusters or arrays of, of abundant tandem repeats as well. Beyond these major categories, there are other categories. So ribosomal DNA is repetitive in nature. Uh, multi-copy genes could be considered repetitive sequences. But for the sake of this talk, um, these two categories, and especially um, an emphasis on uh, transposable elements, is, is what we'll be exploring across insects. Now, um, four other background points that I'd like to hit. First, Repetitive DNA tends to be abundant in most eukaryotic genomes. In the case of humans, two-thirds of our genomic sequence can be assigned to one of those previous categories. Uh, repetitive DNA is also, it tends to be understudied. And certainly when we're dealing with diverse groups like arthropods, um, you know, there's well over a million species that are known for which we simply know nothing about repetitive DNA dynamics. One reason that it has a history of being understudied is it presents some challenges to traditional molecular techniques, whether that's molecular biology based experiments or certainly um, um, genome assembly studies. Repetitive DNA is a little bit hard to deal with. And just as an analogy, anyone who's done a jigsaw puzzle will immediately know what are the hardest parts of this puzzle, um, which are the hardest parts. Um, are going to be. And these are regions of the sky where um, each puzzle piece um, is, is effectively identical to the pieces around it. There's no reference point like a piece of a cloud that can help anchor that piece relative to its surrounding pieces. And similarly, when we're assembling a genome, if there is in the actual geno genome of that organism a highly repetitive region, the sequences that you get of whatever length your sequencing platform provides them, they may not have the ability to be anchored in adjacent unique sequence. And still, um, the algorithms may not be able to also resolve the many copies of that repeat. So inevitably, when we have assemblies where the contigs or scaffolds are fragmented, these typically occur, uh, these breaks in the contiguity around repetitive blocks of sequence. So um, there's certainly some challenges that, that we face from a genomic standpoint. Although they're understudied, although there's challenges, there, there's lots of, lots of evidence um, from uh, a lot of literature that repetitive elements play a variety of critical roles in genomes. And some of these are structural 
roles or roles in genome stability. Um, transposable element sequences are known to um, participate in genome-wide networks that regulate gene expression. Uh, they, they play stories, um, uh, play parts in cancer and aging and human health related stories. Um, and certainly from an evolutionary standpoint, genome size evolution and even the process of speciation um, in, in many cases ties back to repetitive um, sequences within genomes. So um, um, I love, I love this, the title of this recent article by um, um, Stilzer et al., and um, excuse me, Stitzer et al. Looking at, um, at at Maze, they use this this lovely title, the genomic ecosystem of transposable elements. And I think that's an apt analogy to think of the genome as an ecosystem. And and clearly, many of the players within that at the sequence level are repetitive sequences. And they, not surprisingly, play a variety of roles from mutualistic style roles to parasitic style roles within a genome and everything in between. And, um, and so we've moved past this stage of repeats are just junk DNA. We've moved past the paradigm of repeats are simply all deleterious to this more nuanced view. And, and I love that ecosystem-like analogy um, for the genome. And so um, lastly here, um, technology is opening new doors for us to study repetitive elements and there are exciting new doors that are opening so we're seeing dramatic improvements in assembly quality with highly accurate long reads and um, increasing read length and also th that quality is becoming more and more tractable and, and or affordable in in a lot of systems out there so it's an exciting time to to potentially have very high quality and sometimes sometimes chromosome level resolved um, um, assemblies in which we can study repetitive elements in their genomic context. And so moving forward, um, you know, our ability to completely understand complete stories of genome evolution is going to hinge on our ability to also con to, to consider complete genomes, including repetitive sequences within them. So that kind of brings us to the, the study um, at hand and, and, and the backstory here is that um, in a study led by colleague Scott Hotelling, um, we, we had been exploring a data, a data set of 600 insect genomes and looking at the impact of uh, sequencing technology across those genomes. And in the context of that project, we thought, wow, it would be cool to look at the repetitive element landscape across a much larger data set of insects than has been previously considered. And so our first question was simply, um, what are the trends that we see in repetitive element diversity and abundance across this large data set of insects? And um, a second research question, we want to look at how often repetitive elements are impacting gene regions within these assemblies, and also, again, explore the effect of sequencing technology on our ability to detect repetitive elements. And all of these questions kind of led us to this fourth question, which is simply, if we have a large kind of biodiversity scale data set, it becomes important to use automated methods that can maximize throughput. And so if we take an automated approach to annotating repetitive elements, how good of a job can we do in this taxonomically diverse and large data set? And so I'll, I'll briefly touch on these first three and then spend the balance of the time just addressing this fourth research question that we had. So first off, what, do we, what types of trends do we see across insects? And so um, I'm showing you here across the bottom, the, the various insect orders that were represented in our data set. And just as a, an interesting aside, this kind of gives us a sense for, you know, as of a couple of years ago, what did the, the the diversity of available assemblies look like? And, I've, and not surprisingly, um, there's lots of dipterans. Just the genus Drosophila is representing, you know, over a hundred of our assemblies. And then um, it's also interesting to look at. This is this is showing assembly length. This first track. So um, while a lot of the diversity that has been sampled, not surprisingly, have relatively compact genomes. We're starting to see a critical mass accumulate 
of, of less well studied insect lineages um, from a genomic standpoint and um, more opportunities to explore larger, more repeat rich genomes that represent certainly a lot of insect diversity. So that's kind of an interesting, um, it's interesting to see this kind of from a bird's eye view. And so in addition to assembly length here, we're looking at, these are different categories of transposable elements that tend to be abundant in these assemblies. And so we can say, uh, you know, on a scale of zero to 30%, we can notice kind of order level um, patterns across this data set where, you know, lepidopterans, trichopterans, coleopterans, lines, long interspersed nuclear elements, they tend to make up large fractions, in some cases, very large fractions of the total assembly uh, in many lineages, whereas in lineages like Hymenoptera, lines are much less abundant. Um, if we take Lepidoptera, Although lines are abundant, DNA transposons tend to be less abundant, whereas they're highly abundant in lineages like trichoptera, most, most coleoptera rather. And so this was a, a, part of what caused us to go down this road was just to see this type of picture and how, how the diversity and abundance breaks down across insect groups to kind of help give us insights into how repetitive elements have shaped genome evolution across these groups. As we kind of waded into this, one pattern that struck us is that we plotted the proportion of repeats that are unclassified. And what we mean here is the, the, the software that we ran was able to identify a sequence and it said this is present in several copies. And then the next step is to say, can we annotate that? Can we give it a, a known name given, um, given what we know about repeats? In other words, is it an LTR? Is it a DNA transposon? And we were, we were surprised by the fraction of total repeats that we found that could not be classified. And this became an important part of what drove the, the, the last um, research question. And, and so we'll come back to this issue of unclassified repeats. So our next, our next research question was to explore, um, was to explore associations between repetitive elements and, and, and coding genes, uh, coding regions. And we did this um, by leveraging the Busco algorithm. And so it turns out that if a repetitive element like a TE is immediately adjacent or nearly adjacent um, to a Busco gene, that the Busco algorithm, which is identifying open reading frames, it frequently sees open reading frames in this adjacent transposable element and it actually just includes that transposable element in its annotation. And so um, by simply taking instances in which Busco genes also have uh, repetitive sequences embedded within them or appearing adjacent to them, that can, that can give us a surrogate measure for associations between repetitive elements and gene regions. How often are we seeing them interfacing? And this, uh, the, the methods that we used here, we, we um, um, first, first um, stumbled onto this, the pattern that this is common with, with Busco annotations in a paper led by Jacqueline Heckenhauer in caddis flies. And so we took those methods and we scaled them up to this data set across insects. And so um, in, in, in the reason that we were interested in exploring this question is because it's known that when transposable elements move to a new location in the genome, they're often repressed. Their, their additional activity of, of additional transcription, genomes often try to repress their, their transcriptional activity. And this is because if a transposable element is too successful at proliferating, it can compromise genome stability and have some deleterious effects. And so there are kind of um, mechanisms that genomes use to combat this. And one of those is to put uh, silencing epigenetic marks on that transposable element. Um, and these are often like H3K9 methylation marks. And it's also known that if, if a transposable element gets marked with H3K9 meth methylation, those marks can actually spread and impact adjacent regions. And so you can imagine that uh, whether it's a, a regulatory region or the, the open reading frames of a gene itself, um, this, this impact of, of having an adjacent or an interrupting TE can modulate gene expression. And so there's some cool work in mammals led by Cedric Fashat's group and other 
lineages where this regulatory effect of TEs has been, you know, studied in detail. And so exploring this across insects was, was interesting to us. And what we found um, here, the pink track along the top is showing the results. And again, we've got each of these columns is representing an individual assembly within one of these orders. And so we see that um, these RE or repetitive element gene associations, they appear to evolve dynamically across insect orders. They tend to be not especially common in most dipterin lineages, in most hymenopteran lineages, but they can be quite abundant in some of these, um, these other insect orders. And so here we're showing of the 1300 or so Busco genes that we character that we you know that we annotated across all all of these uh these insects how many of those 1300 have evidence of a repetitive element adjacent to or embedded within and in some cases that count gets up to like 25 percent of the buscos that we analyzed have evidence of an association with a repetitive element. So that was a surprising a surprising number. And we think it speaks to, um, again, the fact that we're seeing some, uh, some group-specific patterns emerging. You know, this could be an avenue that, that helps us get more insight into the evolution of genomes and phenotypes as, as insects diversified. We also noted a strong statistical correlation between the abundance of RE gene associations and the uh, genomic abundance of long interspersed nuclear elements. These um, these tend to this repetitive element type seems to have a disproportionate um, impact on coding regions as they as they proliferate and move around within genomes. And so we think we think that insects are an interesting future model to continue ex to explore again the interface between uh, repetitive elements and their impacts on genome evolution, the evolution of the transcriptome and, and phenotypes um, within insects. Our third question was focused on uh, technology impacts. Um, how is long read technology impacting our ability to detect repetitive elements? And what we found is, I'm just gonna leave that there. What we found is uh, overall, if we separate long read assemblies versus short read assemblies, we see a 36% increase in detected repetitive elements. And we see that despite the fact that assembly length actually does not show a significant difference in long versus short read assemblies. And so long read assemblies are um, do, do appear to um, increase our ability to detect repetitive elements. And this is with a pretty coarse binning. This is simply all long read technologies um, to, compared to short read only assemblies. And if we were to parse that out into like, you know, PacBio Hi-Fi and versus older um, iterations of PacBio versus nanopore technologies, we, we may see additional insights, but there, uh, there is a, a pretty notable impact in detection that seems to be technology driven, not surprisingly. Um, we, if we look at specific categories within repetitive elements and say, does it affect, does technology, sequencing technology affect each category equally? And it turns out that some have a disproportionate impact or are impacted to this disproportionate level. So long terminal repeats, they showed 162% increase in detection in uh, long read assemblies. Um, DNA transposon showed a more modest, but still solid increase in detection. And interestingly, long interspersed nuclear elements didn't show a significant difference, um, although they, they were a bit more abundant in long read assemblies. And so we think this is interesting because it kind of gives a baseline of expectation for how annotations, de depending on your sequencing technology, are going to bias specific categories of repeats. And you should expect a disproportionate, uh, the strongest bias with something like a long terminal repeat, whereas lines appear to be largely robust in terms of their detection uh, across different technologies and, and DNA transposons being intermediate. So um, this, this was an interesting finding, we thought, and, and establishes a good baseline for technology-related bias. Now, the, the fourth area that really we began to focus on is 
if we take an, an automated approach, and, and that's again favorable for a large data set, a biodiversity scale study, how good of a job are we able to do at annotating repetitive elements across these genomes? And just to build this up a little bit, I want to just emphasize a few things that are important when we think of annotating repetitive elements. First of all, effective annotation, it, it requires that we have a taxonomic representation within databases that repetitive element annotation software tools use. So those software tools say, here's a repeat. Does it match a repeat that, that we can put into a bin? And it's got to look at an external database um, that, that contains repetitive elements. And so if we have um, a phylogeny of, you know, of insects, for example, and the database only has representation of, of these three species separated across these lineages, then what you'd expect is that if you do a study that has much denser taxonomic sampling, any samples that are in the phylogenetic neighborhood of something that's represented in the database, annotation should be more successful. And if you're in a gap region outside of the phylogenetic neighborhood of, of models in the database, annotation is going to be um, less effective, likely, and at least more stochastic in terms of its success. And so um, we expected that this database representation um, should, should be something that impacts how well we can do. And so we wanted to explore what is the state of insect representation in repetitive element databases. And so here we keyed on RepBase, and RepBase at the time was had by far the, the best representation of, of insect sequences. Um, it was, it was the, the database to look at. And we said of our 154 insect families that are in our study, what fraction of those have at least some representation in rep base? And we found that it was about a third of them, 57 families were represented in rep base. But the bigger story is that although 57 were represented, very few of those were well represented in terms of their repetitive sequence diversity. And so in this, you can see these are the 57 uh, represented families, but all of these white columns, although they're in rep base, they have like zero to 10 total repetitive sequences representing this family. And so it's only a few lineages, um, and not surprisingly, lineages that have a history of genomic studies with model systems that actually have representation of hundreds to thousands of repetitive sequences within rep base. And so we expected, you know, given this analysis of taxonomic distribution in, in this database, we expected that would likely be heavily impacting our ability to simply identify and annotate repeats. And so again, this we think ties back to this trend that we saw of large fractions of unclassifiable repeats across our data set with a few exceptions. And if we look at these data in, in a little bit different way and we group them by order, here's what it looks like. So we've got um, by order, and we've separated out here dipterans that belong to the genus Drosophila, of course, the powerful uh, model organism Drosophila melanogaster, um, being the first insect to have its genome sequenced. And so if you if you belong in the genus Drosophila, or I guess in the family of Drosophilids, maybe is how we've done this, on average, only about 13% of your repeats are going to fall into this unclassified category. So here's the proportion of unclassified repeats. So if you're in near a Drosophila, it's, it's a relatively small fraction. And I, I'll point out, we don't expect to be able to annotate all repeats in an assembly, but ideally we would annotate as many as we can. Some repeats are going to be the ancient remains of, of past transposable element bursts that that they're not going to be identifiable, um, but we want to be able to identify as many as possible. So readily identifiable are the majority of repeats in Drosophila, um, whereas if we take all other insects in our data set, on average, over 40% of repeats could not be classified with and associated with a known, a known repeat category. And in some orders, Thysanoptera, Ephemeroptera, some of these early branches of the insect tree 60 to 80 percent of all repeats couldn't be classified and so this this reinforces this idea that in our excitement to, to look at the repetitive element landscape in insects 
you know, this, this underlying issue, it really limits our ability to make a strong biological statement about um, about the true abundance and diversity of repetitive elements if if we know that there's large fractions that we likely can't classify um, because of some of these underlying issues so you'd hope that you know and our thought is well we're in this this era where there's these initiatives which are which are fantastic and we're always increasing the number of available assemblies and so maybe this 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 issue is is disappearing and and this is an example uh, of a paper from Scott Hotelling and Paul Franson, um, where they looked at just animal genome assemblies and their rate of accumulation. And so, just in the last, you know, um, five or five or seven years, we've gone from just a handful of new assemblies falling in, uh, you know, hitting the NCBI database every month, to in the last few years, some months there are dozens and even hundreds of new assemblies for animals becoming available on a monthly basis. So this, this would hopefully close that gap. And what we did is we actually analyzed in RepBase um, uh, this question. And we said, how many, we compared it to the accumulation of insect families on GenBank. So um, in the last, you know, several couple decades, how often, three decades, how often are new insect families appearing on GenBank and we see similar to that last graph for animals, we do see in the last, you know, especially five to seven years, a rapid accumulation of new insect families that have assemblies on GenBank. And then we said, how about rep base? Are we seeing a proportional increase in the, the taxa, the new families represented by rep base? And, and we do not see um, that increase. We see at best a flat line here. And so what this suggests is that this annotation bottleneck, it's actually worsening as we add more and more and more taxa for which we can't really effectively annotate their repetitive elements. And um, I'll point out that in the transposable element community, the folks that really think about, you know, repetitive DNA deeply, this is a well-known, this is a well-known issue. It's been published on for, you know, at least the last 10 or 12 years. And, and so this is this is well known until a community within folks thinking about genome research. But um, we think that this suggests a disconnect between fields. We suggest we think this suggests a lack of either awareness or observation of best, best practices as we moved into an era of biodiversity genomics, where lots of the new assemblies can be generated by a wider variety of researchers. We think this is just simply a case where those best practices have not have not become mainstream and and therefore we're not seeing the contributions to the these databases that really um rely you know we rely on for 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 improving our ability to study whole genomes and I'll, I'll again emphasize we don't we don't think this is an issue with the rep base folks dfam is a new is a new excellent resource for repetitive element data as a repetitive element database this is a community best practice. This is the community of researchers that could community that could contribute. Um, we need to shore up um, awareness and contributions there to support the folks that are building the infrastructure there. Um, we were thrilled that our study triples the number of insect families that are available in public repositories, and we hope that you know we can continue to um, to, to 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 make progress and, and do better there. So. Um, you know, to kind of wrap up, I just want to propose that the timing is really ideal right now for for the community of folks generating genomes in the biodiversity world to embrace repetitive elements. The technology advances, they're letting us, in some cases, look at very, very well assembled genome assemblies that could include lots of rich biology about repetitive elements um, and how they interface with the rest of the genome and, and the unprecedented quality, you know, is compelling. We could study repeats much better. And we've also got much denser taxonomic sampling. So we could address these database issues with a, a stepping up our, our best practices as a community. And so um, just if any of this you know, strikes a chord, a few action items that I think are really accessible. First of all, as a community of folks thinking about biodiversity, let's embrace repetitive elements. Let's look at whole genomes and not just the unique sequences. And as we as we embrace that, um, our, the stories that we can tell as we produce these genomes become richer, um, certainly. And so, 
Um, it'll enhance the biology as we as we increase our literacy of repetitive elements. Um, there's a lot of great reviews out there that make this really accessible. This is one of my favorites um, that can can just increase our increase literacy um, and improve the the studies that we that we tackle as we publish these. Next, let's um, let's do better at documenting repetitive elements in the assemblies we produce. Um, whether you're generating an assembly or whether you're evaluating one as a reviewer, encourage reporting and documentation of repetitive elements if you don't see it there. And this will add to our base knowledge of repetitive elements and, and again, new insights into our studies. And then next, we can contribute to repetitive element library curation and database submission. And again, this is an area that, that, that can become much more mainstream. What we found after our study is we submitted our sequences to DFAM. The DFAM folks were fantastic. They made it really painless. They said, oh, this is great. They actually reached out to us and they said, do you have these files? You know, you ran repeat modeler too. Do you still have these files? Send them to us and we'll get all these sequences added to our database. And so um, it, it's tractable. It's not a huge burden. And if we if we contribute, then these folks are going to continue to be able to show um, products from their from their efforts and and have continued funding. And, and we're going to accelerate our ability to understand genomes as we do that. And so, in addition to submitting, um, we provided here some some resources that we found useful to ju again just just increase literacy, um, jump into to ways that we that that we can approach this. Um, with a, a beginner's guide to manual curation, details about the DFAM resource and, and also TE Hub, which is a nice community um, resource curated by Tyler Elliott. And so, um, so good folks, good community, and the biodiversity genomics community, we can just we can just dive into this and embrace it. And um, it'll it'll help us as much as as it helps these databases. And so um, with that, I'll just mention that I'm, I'm currently recruiting uh, grad students, and I'd be thrilled if if um, if any were interested or, or pass that along. You can reach out to me through my email address here. Topics include repetitive elements, biodiversity, rapid genome evolution, and insects. I want to shout out again to fantastic uh, collaborators that are a joy to work with, and thank you. And take any questions if we have time for that. Take care. All right, thank you so much, John. That was a fantastic talk. We have some interesting questions um, popping up as well that I hope you can answer for us. Um, so I was, uh, this is my own question. I was a little curious in the original figure you showed where it broke apart genome size and all the different types of repetitive elements. Did you only use long read genomes for that uh, analysis? Or is some of the variation within different orders maybe due to just the quality of the genomes? Yeah, that's a great question. That the big figure, the big linear figure that has the different tracks in it, that includes, you know, our, our first data set had about 600 and something genomes. And we did some quality filtering based on actually just boost go scores. That was the best metric that we could universally apply across assemblies. And so some of our downstream analysis, we just, um, we chose those that were above like a 90% BUSCO completeness threshold, but that figure includes both short and long read genomes. And surely some of the variation, you know, a meta-analysis like this where you're, you know, you're harvesting all these genomes, that's, that's a, a big piece of, a big challenge is just like, you know, these, these have different origins. And so, um that's a that's a bird's eye view of both long and short read together and and there is certainly noise um and variation in in, in abundance of some of these repeats uh, we've in other papers we've explored that and, and we haven't found evidence that it's like wild abund uh, wild differences you know um you know um the long read assemblies we we expect there to be better detection especially some categories but that combined both both technology types okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was one of those that was not aware of these repeat databases. So we have, I think we have several we can we can share with you. Cool. Um, all right. So as far as questions from our attendees, we had several about uh, the annotation of the repeat associated genes. Um, 
someone asked, uh, is there particular biological pathways that are involved or impacted in the RE genes? And in particular, we had someone ask if there was maybe uh, genes related to metabolism and olfactory perception. And I know, um, you know, you answered that online that you didn't really get into that, but do you remember anything about some specific groups? Right. So um, in terms of the genes that are impacted by these transposable elements, we, we were excited to look into that. We started to look into that. We didn't get as far as a formal analysis. And then as we wrote it up, we just we didn't have time to go there. So I think that's a it's a fascinating question to go through those and say, are there is there bias towards specific pathways? And so I don't have an answer as to which pathways might be disproportionately affected. Um, it's um, it wouldn't surprise me if folks have looked at that in non-arthropod groups. Like, like I said, Cedric Fashat's group has looked a lot in like mammals and they've probably done analyses like that, whether they would be, you know, relevant for, for arthropods. I don't know, but it's, 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 it's a, it's an interesting question that, that I don't yet have the answer to. Cool. All right. Another, um, another person, uh, of course says very nice presentation. Uh, we are studying insects that have a high number of very similar uh, satellites. For example, the Tenebrio molitor genome has 60% of a highly similar satellite. For that reason, only about half of the genome um, can be assembled. Um, and we need even longer reads to try to approach these regions. How do satellites affect the overall repetitive content in these assemblies? And are you aware of other insects that have such high satellite content? That's a great question. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, and and um, I have a secret love for satellite DNAs, and so I, I love the question. Um, the, um, the, the first question, how do satellites affect overall repetitive content? So our, our estimates, we have one of our tracks is what fraction of the genome is repetitive. And, and for those lineages that have high satellite abundance, those are going to be especially underestimated in assembly-based approaches. And so uh, a more effective way to, to estimate satellite DNA content is instead of using an assembly where the a large block of satellites, satellites can go on for megabases in some insect genomes and centromeres and telomeres. And those simply get collapsed in assemblies if they're, if they're you know, highly similar satellite sequences. And so um, a better way to estimate satellite abundance is to take raw reads and actually do, do use a clustering al algorithm like Repeat Explorer 2, um, for example. And, um, and that's because, because um, we were working with assemblies, we haven't looked, we didn't dive in deeply into satellite DNAs in terms of, um, and so that there, there's an underestimated repetitiveness, especially in lineages where they're satellite rich. Um, in terms of whether other species have such high satellite content, I work on a, a ground beetle species group that has up to about 60% of abundance. It seems as though many beetle lineages are very satellite rich. Certainly many diptera lineages are satellite rich. Um, Trichoptera, I have some experience there. They don't seem to be satellite rich. And incidentally, their assembly quality, um, tends their contiguity tends to be much better. And so that challenge of... Um, does the technology tackle satellites yet? And it, it simply doesn't um, for those lineages that have a lot of abundant satellites. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a lot of questions pouring in now. Um, let's see. Um, did you make analysis of repetitive DNA accumulation considering the chromosomal types? And what they mean is there are different patterns of expression of repeats depending on uh, depending if the group has monocentric versus holocentric chromosomes. Very cool question. I, I, and I don't know the answer to that. That would be that would be a great layer, you know. Um, you know what now that we've got a data set together like this, you know, it, it's 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 it'd be very cool to just continue to add layers of biology. And so we haven't overlaid the chromosomal um, arrangements onto that, but it's a fantastic idea. This is another interesting question. Are you seeing evidence of transposable or repetitive elements moving between, excuse me, between taxa? Yeah, um, another, so so one of the things that we're, we're excited to do is we've made a contribution to repeat databases, but if we did a phylogenetic analysis of all of the repeats that we've now characterized across insects, it's a perfect time to do like 
a, a phylogenetic analysis of the repetitive elements. And that could actually help us really improve the curation of repetitive element taxonomy. I didn't mention this. I had some text about it, but but just like in, you know, insects have a taxonomy, repetitive elements also have a taxonomy and, and it ties into these issues. And so um, what one of our downstream goals is to do that huge phylogenetic analysis that establishes um, homology of repeats across insects that can help us improve the taxonomy and help us I, I expect to see lateral transfer events shortly. And, and so the short answer is, yeah, we, we, we haven't looked, but it's, it's, it's another, it's another one of those items on the checklist for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of questions and not enough time to answer them all live. Um, I don't know if you have a favorite, otherwise I'll just read another one off the top here. Um, um, I will, I see someone's requesting a DFAM link and I'm happy to post that. Um, and um, um the just just jeff scott asked um what level of genome variation of repetitive elements exists between strains of the same species and i think that's a fascinating that's a fascinating idea the the, the, the classical model organisms folks i think are just getting there to where we're saying let's look at population level patterns of of repetitive elements and see species level variation i've looked at that with satellite dnas in beetles and and, and there can be there can be notable differences in satellite DNA abundance within lineages, and 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 it actually is pulling me down down the the rabbit hole of are these the same lineage now or are they different based on the level of variation in satellite DNAs, and so um, it's these are certainly the most dynamically evolving parts of genomes, and so in terms of genome size differences across at below the species level, I'd expect that repetitive elements commonly make up a large fraction of that variation. Right. I'll continue answering though. Thanks so much for the questions and I'll, I'll chip away at them um, in, in All the right. Yeah, Yeah, if you could do that. And then if we have extra time at the very end, if there's something you want to discuss further, we can maybe bring that up at the end. Um, but fantastic talk. A lot of people have a lot of interest in this, um, including myself. So uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much for, for sharing. Um, all right, so we'll move on now to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Dr. Dorothea Toll. Uh, she's a professor at Virginia Tech University. She studies the formation and biological function of small molecules used in organism environment interactions. Um, currently, she focuses on aspects of genomics, metabolism, and volatiles in plants, as well as uh, biochemical evolution, chemical ecology, and genetic engineering of insect pheromones. Um, her talk today is entitled Genomic Organization and Evolution of Terpene Pheromone Biosynthetic Genes in Stink Bugs. So welcome and thank you for your interest in my presentation. My name is Dorothea Toll. I'm professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this year's Arthropod Genomics Symposium, particularly Lindsay Perkin for a kind invitation to me to present uh, at the symposium. And in my talk today, I will present some of our latest work on terpene pheromone biosynthesis and stink bugs the genomic organization of terpene biosynthetic genes and their evolution in these species and in um, other insects. So um, research in our lab is primarily focused on uh, the metabolism, evolution, and function of small molecules, particularly volatile semiochemicals or infochemicals that are important in chemical interactions of plants and insects. As you probably know, plants can release um, a large number of volatile compounds in their direct or indirect chemical defense against herbivores. Uh, they can also use volatiles in the attraction of beneficial organisms such as pollinators. And likewise, insects are capable of using volatiles for the chemical defense, such as, for instance, this larva of the eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly that releases volatile compounds from specific uh, defense organs, which we call osmoteria toward of predators. And volatile compounds certainly are hugely important as um, pheromones in intraspecific interactions um, of insects. 
Um, we are particularly interested in those volatile compounds that belong to the class of isoprenoids or terpenes. Terpenes represent the largest group of natural products or semiochemicals in nature, and they are common in uh, insects as well. Here are a few examples of volatile terpenes. Up here, for instance, is an aggregation pheromone of the pine graver beetle, Ipspinae. This is a monoterpene. 10 carbon terpene a compound. Down here are a number of sesquiterpene volatiles, which contain 15 carbons. And you can see that these, these molecules can serve as sex or aggregation pheromones or alarm pheromones. Morgantia, for instance, is an aggregation pheromone of the harlequin bug, Morgantia histrionica, and we'll talk more about that um, today. Um, if we expand our view into other insect orders in terms of volatile terpenes, we can indeed see that they are very common in the insect world. For instance, they can serve as uh, uh, chemical defenses in the basal lineage of um, stick insects. They occur as uh, pheromones in the Blattodean lineage, um, in thrips. I will talk more about Hemiptera today. Uh, we find them as pheromones in the Hymenoptera, in beetles, um, in butterflies, and they have also been um, reported in, um, in flies. So they're very common among uh, the insecta. Um, we also see chemical conversions of volatile terpenes between plants and insects. Just a few examples here again. This molecule, sesquipiperitol, is actually the precursor of morgantio that I just mentioned in the previous slide. And it can, made, can be made by species in the ginger family. Or an, another example, um, beta caryophylline is a sex pheromone in the Asian lady beetle, Hormonia xyridis, but it is also released from leaves or flowers uh, by a large number of uh, plant species. So uh, terpene biosynthesis in plants uh, has been studied for decades and is very well understood, and likewise also in microbes such as fungi and bacteria, but on the insect side, um, our knowledge is still very limited as to what extent insects can synthesize volatile terpenes de novo, and if they can do that, uh, how has terpene biosynthesis um, evolved in insects? And um, here I just give you a very simplistic overview of what we know how terpenes are generated in plants. Uh, you might know that terpenes in pretty much all organisms are derived from these C5 uh, uh, prenodiphosphate uh, precursors, which we call isopentanyl diphosphate, IPP, and this is its isomer, dimethyl allyl diphosphate, DMAPP. And these C5 units can be conjugated by enzymes in the IDS or isoprenyl diphosphate synthase family uh, to longer um, uh, prenyl diphosphate intermediates, which we call geranyl diphosphate. Um, which contains 10 carbons, parnasyl diphosphate with 15 carbons, and geranyl, geranyl diphosphate with 20 carbon atoms. And these intermediates can then be used as substrates by enzymes called terpene synthases that convert them into um, a large number of different monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, or diterpenes, which stand for C10, C15, and C20. Um, terpenes. And these pathways or biosynthesis can occur in plastids as well as in the cytosol in plants. Now in insects, we know that IDS enzymes, isoprenyl diphosphate synthases, also exist. They are important, for instance, in generating farnesyl diphosphate, which is an important intermediate in juvenile hormone biosynthesis. We also uh, know that IDS enzymes can make GPP. They're capable of making GGPP. Uh, but what we have not known for a long time is whether th these intermediates can be converted by some type of enzyme with terpene synthase activity um, into uh, terpene semiochemicals or precursors of um, these um, semiochemicals. And so we um, started um, uh, several years ago to try to find answers to this question by studying terpene pheromone biosynthesis in stink bugs. And as you know, stink bugs are common around uh, the globe. There are many uh, stink bug species that are severe pests on uh, different um, uh, types of crops. And what caught our attention as terpene biochemists is the fact that um, 
these many of these species release male specific aggregation or sex pheromones um, in the form of sesquiterpene volatiles. You can see a number of these molecules here, and you when you look closely, you can see that they are all structurally related. In fact, they are carrying a bisabulan type um, skeleton. We started our research with the um, Harlequin mark, Mogentia histrionica, that's a cabbage specialist and prevalent in the southeast of the United States. And males release uh, this molecule or isomers of this molecule as their aggregation pheromone. We call this Mogential. And interestingly, the brown marmorated stink bug, Haliomorpha halis, which is native to East Asia, um, also releases uh, this type of molecule. In in a different isomeric uh, composition. These uh, species up here are neotropical. They occur in South America and are severe pests on rice. And their aggregation of sex pheromone uh, contains zingiberinol as a major constituent. And up here we have the uh, globally invasive uh, southern green stink bug, Nezara viridula. Males of this species released um, isomers of cis alpha bisabulin epoxide and uh, the same type of pheromone we also find in the related uh, Chinavia and Pictocornis. So the structural relationship of these um, um, terpene pheromones prompted us to predict that these compounds are made probably by evolutionary related biosynthetic pathways in these stink bug species and that they're not derived from precursors that um, these species would take up from their host plants because they all feed on very different um, host plants and many of these plants are not even uh, synthesizing any of these um, terpenes. So we tried to understand how these pheromones are made in uh, these stink bugs. And I focus here now only on uh, the species that uh, we investigated in more detail, the southern green stink bug, uh, the harlequin bug, and the brown marmorated stink bug. And we predicted that the pheromones would be um, um, originating um, or derived from um, pharmaceutical diphosphate, which is an important intermediate in uh, juvenile hormone biosynthesis, as I already mentioned. And we know that FPP can be made from an IDS type enzyme from FPP synthase from the C5 uh, carbon precursors. But we didn't know anything about how the conversion of FPP to these terpenes would take place. So we generated um, transcriptome data sets from males and females in the southern green stink bug, in the harlequin bug, and we also took advantage of already existing transcriptome data sets and genome resources that had been generated by our collaborators at the USDA um, in Beltsville, particularly Michael Sparks and um, Don gunnison Windows lab and Don Weber. And so what we found when we use these resources and what we found in our transcriptomes um, is a type of enzyme that is capable of converting FPP into this sesquiterpene alcohol, sesquipiperitol, that I already mentioned um, a few slides ago. These enzymes are interesting because they are um, related to these precursor enzymes, to these IDS type um, um, enzymes or FPP synthases that can generate FPP. But these enzymes are not capable of making FPP anymore. Instead, they take FPP as a substrate and convert it into um, a terpene precursor of the pheromone. Um, it was also uh, interesting to see that the sesquipiperitol synthases of the brown marmorated stink bug and harlequin bug are closely related. They share more than 80% sequence identity. So this enzyme or gene has been highly conserved in these species despite um, their uh, different uh, geographical origin. We predict that sesquipiperitol synthase is further converted into the final pheromone product via this uh, zingiberinol intermediate. We have not identified these um, enzymatic steps yet, but zingiberinol, you might remember, is also um, a pheromone of um, several rice stink bugs. So we assume that these species also use similar biosynthetic pathways. And via differential um, gene expression analysis, we also found in the southern green stink bug an IDS type turpin synthase that converts FPP into cis alpha bisabulin as the likely precursor of um, the alpha bisabulin epoxide. We assume that there's an oxidation uh, happening here via cytochrome P450 epoxidase. 
Uh, and we're currently trying to identify this particular gene or enzyme. I should also mention that we have RNAi-based evidence um, in the um, Harlequin bug that this that this type of um, enzyme is really important in the pheromone biosynthetic pathway. So based on these findings, and I should say also findings from other groups that have worked on tryptin synthesis in Coleoptera and uh, Lepidoptera in the meantime, we now know that terpene, uh, terpenes can indeed be made by insects de novo. They possess the enzymatic machinery to do that. They have IDS type enzymes and they have or IDS enzymes and they have IDS type terpene synthesis that can convert these prenyldyne phosphates. Um, into uh, terpenes, such as FPP into sesquiterpenes. And these enzymes obviously have evolved from IDS type progenitors. Um, since we have genomes available from the brown marmorated stink bug and more recently also the southern green stink bug, uh, we asked questions of how are these IDS type terpene synthesis genes structured? Uh, how are they organized in the insect genomes? And when we look into the genome of the brown marmorated stink bug, we find um, a small gene family of these IDS-like genes. Uh, seven uh, gene members, this is still a small gene family in comparison to the large gene families that we find in plants or microbes. This is interesting by itself in terms of terpene metabolism evolution in plants versus animals. And so there is a, a canonical type um, FPP synthase. Um, this gene encodes a true FPP synthase that's important for juvenile hormone biosynthesis and, of course, making the precursor for the terpene pheromone. Um, this is located on a separate scaffold. Um, the remaining genes are located in th uh, two different uh, gene clusters. One of these uh, gene clusters uh, contains the sesquipiperitol synthase that's involved in pheromone biosynthesis, and the other gene cluster um, also contains a gene that encodes a protein that makes um, sesquiterpenes in vitro, as we found, but we don't know the function of this gene in vivo. The other four genes seem to be lowly or no, not expressed, um, and they might not have any particular function at this point of time. Um, we also looked into the gene structures here and we see that um, all of these genes contain um, seven introns and eight exons but you clearly see a difference for the canonical type fpp synthase gene in comparison to the other genes with this expansion of um, introns so this gene is quite different um, it's in its um, location in the genome in terms of its gene structure and if we compare amino acid sequences between this canonical fpp synthases FPP synthase and the other um, proteins, we only find 20 to 30 percent sequence identity. So these genes or proteins have diverged quite a while ago in pentatomic evolution or um, perhaps in, in hemipteran um, evolution. In terms of expression of these genes, um, the um, uh, sesquipiperitol synthase gene is expectedly very highly expressed in males because males are releasing the aggregation pheromone. And if we look at different tissues um, in the male, um, the FPP synthase and the sesquipiperitol synthase are most highly expressed in the fat body. And I come back to that um, in a minute. Um, when we look into the genome of the southern green stink bug, we find a similar um, organization of a small uh, gene family. There are only five um, IDS type um, um, gene members here. Uh, there is a canonical FPP synthase um, on chromosome 2, and that's not further clustered as we have seen in the brown marmorated stink bug genome. We have a small uh, gene cluster on chromosome 6 that contains the bisabolin synthase gene that's involved in pheromone biosynthesis. And very interestingly, on chromosome 4, we found a single um, terpene synthase. And when we express the recombinant protein um, in E. coli and assayed it in vitro, we found that this protein can make sesquipiperitol, which was quite unexpected because um, sesquipiperitol doesn't seem to be involved in pheromone biosynthesis in Isara viridula. So the function of this gene is not um, clear in vivo. It's lowly expressed in Isara males, but it is um, an active or potentially active enzyme. Um, this um, uh, sesquipiperitol synthase is also 
um, uh, closely related to the sesquipedal synthesis from harlequin bug and brown marmorated stink bug. Um, again, about 80% uh, sequence identity. So again, this sesquipedal synthase uh, gene and gene function seems to be highly conserved among different um, stink bug uh, species. So we were um, also, of course, interested in the phylogenetic relationship of these IDS type um, TPS genes or proteins with other um, canonical IDS and FPP uh, synthase um, proteins or genes in the pentatomates um, and other insects. And I show you here a maximum likelihood um, phylogeny. Uh, we've um, uh, generated these phylogenies also with Bayesian analysis and we find um, a similar outcome. And uh, what you see here is that these um, ideas derived terpene synthesis and stink bugs um, occur in two uh, paralogous clades, uh, which we named TPSA and TPSB. The TPSA clade contains the sesquipipriotol synthesis and the TPSB clade, the bisabulene synthase from Mazara viridula. And this uh, correlates with the uh, gene cluster um, um, evolution in the genomes. We also found that these IDS type TPS um, genes seem to be derived from FPP synthase or IDS type canonical um, uh, progenitors in the petatomids and most likely hemiptera um, at large. Interestingly, what we see from this phylogeny also is that a similar um, emergence of terpene synthases has um, occurred in beetles. So terpene synthases, I mentioned that earlier, have also been uh, found in, in um, um, different uh, coleoptera species, such as the uh, striped flea beetle and Ips pinei, and we see a similar independent um, emergence from FPPS uh, progenitors um, in, in the coleoptera. Um, so in terms of the evolutionary scenario for token synthesis in stink bugs, uh, we um, assume that via an ancestral gene duplication, TPSA and TPSB type uh, genes have emerged, and via further gene duplications, gene clusters um, were generated um, in the different genomes. Maybe gene loss was also involved. Um, the sesquipiparatol synthase in the southern green stink bug um, uh, is, does not uh, have any neighboring genes. Um, that uh, derive are derived from tandem uh, gene duplications. And within these clusters, um, neo-functionalization uh, most likely occurred under selective pressures, for instance, to make um, a particular um, sex or aggregation pheromones, but some genes, uh, despite their activity, um, might not be related to uh, pheromone biosynthesis and might have adopted different functions. Um, we also see evidence of IDS type putative terpene synthesis in the genome of the brown stink bug, Eurychistus heros, but this is a species that does not release any volatile terpenes. So, again, the function of these uh, particular genes um, is currently unknown. Just a quick word about uh, the tissue specific expression of these. Um, uh, terpene synthases. I already mentioned that the sesquipiparatol synthase in the brown marmorated stink bug is most highly expressed in the fat body. We see a similar expression also in the southern green stink bug, but uh, the expression pattern seems to be different in the harlequin bug, where the highest expression of the sesquipiparatol synthase occurs in tissue that's associated with um, the cuticle at the eventual abdomen, abdomen uh, where the pheromone is actually released. Um, these two species do not carry any pheromone-specific glands, and will be interesting to see how pheromone um, uh, biosynthesis, uh, transport of pheromone precursors, and so on is regulated um, at the tissue-specific level. Uh, in the southern green stink bug, we find highest, highest expression of the bisabulin synthase in this uh, cuticle associated tissue at the ventral abdomen. Um, and that makes sense because a pheromone glands occur um, in this particular tissue. Um, so based on our findings in these three different stink bugs, we were also interested in, do we find uh, IDS type terpene synthase genes also in other hemipteran species that are releasing volatile terpenes as 
um, pheromones or um, for chemical defense. And for that, my uh, PhD student, uh, Zali Ripolz, um, was mining nucleotide and um, transcriptome and CBI databases for IDS type uh, sequences in a larger number of hemipteran species. And so he um, found about 300 uh, sequences. And uh, most of these sequences that he found were canonical to, um, FPP synthases. And these are indicated here in gray in this um, cladogram. So that's not surprising because FPP synthases, as I mentioned several times, are um, important for um, um, basal um, hormone um, uh, biosynthesis. But he also found a number of uh, IDS derived or FPP synthase derived sequences with putative terpene synthase uh, function in a number of species that uh, to the most part are capable of releasing volatile terpenes with different functions. So we found um, the um, TPSA and TPSB type um, um, IDS um, uh, derived terpene synthases, but then evidence also for similar uh, sequences in um, the infraorder of the pentatomorpha, the semicomorpha, uh, within the suborder of the Heteroptera, and then also some sequences and species of the suborder of the Sternorhynchia. So the, the color coding here on the perimeter indicates the different um, suborders. And uh, here are just a few examples of species where we found these particular genes. Uh, this is the same um, um, phylogeny, just unrooted, um, um, uh, an unrooted um, Phylogram here, these are color coded again, uh, these specific IDS derived um, uh, sequences um, or proteins. And so we found um, uh, some of those um, not only in um, uh, the pentatomids that we had already investigated, but also, for instance, in predatory stink bugs mm -hmm. uh, like the um, uh, spine soldier bug, Buddhism maculiventris. Um, or in um, among the pentatomorpha in a burrow bug and the box elder bug, you might notice that these molecules are actually not sesquiterpenes, these are uh, monoterpenes. And so if we predict that these IDS type terpene synthases um, could potentially convert GPP instead of FPP um, into monoterpenes. And among the sternorynchia, just a few examples here. Um, we found evidence for terpene synthases in um, the um, cotton mealy bug, which makes an interesting um, irregular cyclobutan terpene derivative as a pheromone. And in lux insects like Carrier lacca, uh, sesquiterpene acids are made as components of their hardened secretion. So these are just a few examples. And if you're interested in, in more details, please visit our um, um, publication associated with this study. So if we put this all together um, in, uh, in hemiptera evolution, uh, we have found evidence for the presence of volatile terpenes and the presence of um, FPP synthase derived, uh, uh, characterized and uncharacterized terpene synthases in the infraorders, the pentatomorpha, the semicomorpha. We found evidence of these um, uh, genes or proteins in the suborder of the sternorynchia. Aphids uh, do release beta farnesine as an alarm pheromone, but we do not really find evidence of uh, putative terpene synthesis in uh, this lineage. So it's still not clear how beta farnesine is made in aphids. Uh, we also had some evidence of putative terpene synthesis in nipomorpha and aquatic bugs, but uh, we do not find much evidence of terpenes in the literature in, these, in this particular lineage. Um, so we assume that uh, these uh, IDS or FPP as derived putative terpene synthases in these different suborders might have evolved from um, an ancient FPPS or um, IDS a progenitor in a common or shared ancestor of these um, suborders, and that these genes might have been lost in miniatures where we don't find any terpenes. This could be because terpenes have been replaced by other chemical compounds for chemical communication, 
or intra interactions might not depend on chemicals and they're mostly dependent on acoustic signals such maybe as for instance in, in cicadas and, and plant hoppers. It's also possible that there have been, has been an independent evolution of these genes or proteins in the different suborders, but based on our um, larger scale phylogeny, we believe that these IDS type genes emerged most likely within a shared ancestral lineage. And that could have happened maybe 300 or even 350 a million years ago. Now, in the last few minutes of my presentation, I just quickly want to mention that we are certainly um, interested also in the structural and amino acid changes that underlie the um, convergence of these IDS enzymes into IDS type terpene synthases. And I can't go much into detail because of limited time, but we're working with our collaborator, Paul O'Malley, on these um, particular structural changes. We have identified a number of amino acid and residue changes, which are, I indicate here uh, with this color coding, in terpene synthases in comparison to the canonical FPP synthases. And those residue changes occur in what we define um, IPP binding motifs or IBMs. There are six of these IBMs, and those are um, residues or motifs that are important in IDS enzymes to bind IPP. And the ability of binding IPP seems to ha have been lost in the insect terpene synthases. And with the loss of IPP binding, most likely terpene synthase activity was facilitated. Um, these um, residue changes correlate with changes in the electrostatic surface in the active site of these terpene synthases, as you can see down here in comparison to FPP synthesis, um, but there's much more that needs to be um, done at this point. It's more theoretical. We need definitely more experimental evidence um, for um, these um, structural changes. But based on what we have found so far, we were also interested in to what extent IDS type terpene synthesis might have evolved in a larger number of different insect orders. So we again um, mined a large number of putative IDS type or IDS derived um, uh, proteins and uh, we generated larger phylogenies and what we found is that as you can see here um, um, IDS type um, putative terpene synthases um, uh, probably have emerged independently and multiple times in different insect orders, and those are color-coded here. And they have not only emerged from FPP synthases, as I showed you with the Hemiptera example, um, but they most likely also emerged from geranyl, geranyl diphosphate synthases. If you remember from the beginning of my presentation, those are the enzymes that can make 20 carbon prenyl diphosphates. So there's strong evidence that terpene synthase, synthases uh, can evolve also from these type of enzymes and maybe even from prenyl diphosphate synthases that generate very long prenyl diphosphates, such as 50 carbon uh, diphosphates. These enzymes are called decaprenyl um, diphosphate uh, synthases. So overall, our findings indicate multiple uh, that um, ID, um, terpene synthases have evolved um, multiple times from IDS progenitors in these different um, insect lineages. Many of them are uncharacterized, only a few have been functionally characterized, so these represent just the tip of the iceberg. So in summary, I hope I could show you that stink bugs and probably many other insects can produce terpene volatiles and semiochemicals de novo. Um, insect terpene synthases emerged from IDS progenitors, and it's important to note that um, these terpene synthases are unrelated to those that we have um, uh, found in plants and microbes. Um, uh, the TPS evolution in insects involves gene duplications, gene clustering, and neofunctionalization. Uh, the expression of these genes is uh, tissue specific, and the structural evolution of these terpene synthases from IDS progenitors is dependent on the loss of binding motifs for IPP but probably also other structural changes we have not completely identified yet. And lastly, IDS type TPS genes uh, most likely emerged from different IDS progenitors in various insect orders. 
Um, so that's the end of my presentation. My acknowledgments go to um, a former PhD student of mine, Jason Lancaster, who really kicked off this entire project several years ago. My current PhD student, Sally Ripholz, and uh, postdoc Haley Rose. She is actually a USDA postdoctoral fellow. Um, several um, other masters and uh, former uh, PhD students and our important collaborators, especially Paul Malley from um, Stanford Research International, with whom we uh, perform the protein structural work, and um, our longstanding uh, collaborators at the USDA in Beltsville, Don Weber, Ashot Krimian, Michael Sparks, Sakat Gosh, and Don Gunderson Rindal. We have a fruitful, um, very productive collaboration for several years. These are our uh, funding sources. And with that, um, um, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Another fantastic talk. Um, we do have a few questions here. Um, so Ellie asks, and this is very similar to a question I was going to ask as well. Um, is there, he says, can we imagine industrial applications to improve reproduction or avoid specific species? Um, I, I work with, um, with weevils and we, you know, we use pheromone lures and traps and such um, for them. So if you could, if you could expand on that. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And I wanted to include some of, you know, the applications that we have in mind in the presentation, but there was just not enough time. So, um, so we, first of all, we, we do a lot of basic research, but we have an applied angle as well. So we, we really like to finish the pathways that we're just looking at, at the, at the moment. So we, you know, identified the terpene synthase, but we need to also identify the downstream enzymes such as P450s. And we're currently working on that. Once we are done with that, we have all of our gene tools together so that we can basically use them for synthetic biology approaches. And so what we have in mind is that we could develop more sustainable ways to um, produce these um, um, aggregation pheromones or sex pheromones. And you could do that by engineering them into microbial systems and platforms such as, for instance, yeast, so develop biotechnological approaches to generate these, these pheromones. So that's one angle that we think about. Um, the other possibilities would be to engineer these, uh, these pathways directly into plants, and we're working on that as well. So Haley LaRose, my postdoc, is, uh, is doing this at the, at the moment. We will start with Nicotiana for a transient expression system, and then we could expand on that and engineer this pathway potentially into trap plants. So that would be kind of our end goal, uh, so that we could enhance the attractiveness of trap plants by uh, the release of these aggregation pheromones. Now that's proof of principle at this point, and uh, there's a lot more work that would need to be done in the field and so on, we know that, um, but that's kind of our um, thought about potential applications. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I hadn't thought about actually, you know, having plants express these volatiles. That's really cool. Um, okay, so another question is, are the PFAM definitions for these synthases being updated for forthcoming annotations? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we hope that they are going to be uh, updated because all of these IDS type genes or proteins, they're currently annotated as FPP synthase like genes, and certainly they are not. Um, they have very different functions. It depends on you know, the residue changes that are pointed out. And so um, I, I definitely would be um, you know, strongly advocating that uh, these definitions um, are updated. Um, okay, we have another question that just came in. Um, of course, they start by saying you had a very lovely talk. Talk, excuse me. Um, like prokaryotes and lower eukaryotes, do you think it is possible to mine insect genomes for pathways related with terpene biosynthesis pathways using the property of gene clustering as you see some evidence of TPS gene clustering? 
Yeah, so that's definitely something that we try to use as a tool to see whether there are terpene biosynthetic pathways. So the clusters that we see are basically gene duplications, but we know from, uh, from plants or from microbes that whole uh, biosynthetic pathways can be clustered. So you would not only you know, define the terpene synthase, but you would have uh, cytochrome P450 or other uh, uh, genes in the pathway being located in, in, entire, in an entire biosynthetic gene cluster. Uh, we have not found any evidence for that in uh, our current work. Uh, we know in other animals, such as, for instance, corals, and this is just work that was uh, published last year that biosynthetic gene clusters also can occur in, in animals. But so far we have not seen this, uh, but we are on the lookout. Um, there could be also potential horizontal gene tra transfer. This has been shown in mites that obviously a microbial type terpene synthase or whole gene family has been transferred into mite genomes. Um, I think we just simply don't know enough at this point and we really need to understand um, much better the genomic organization of these pathways. Very cool. All right, and then a few other questions. So Ellie has another question. He works in a production of insects as food, um, and he's asking if, if we could use pheromones to monitor insect welfare, perhaps, like if they have a stress pheromone could maybe tell us they're not very happy. <laughs> uh, potentially, yes. Um, it's, it's almost similar to the work that we do on plants where we you know, try to monitor uh, the release of stress terpenoids or volatiles. And there's a lot of work that's currently done to develop really sens uh, very sensitive um, you know, instrumentation to monitor these, these volatile emissions. So perhaps this could also be done by insects. This is a really cool um, idea. I haven't really thought about that, but maybe yeah, uh, similar tools could be developed. Yeah. All right, and then um, one last question, and then we'll uh, we'll have to move on. But um, let's see. Kevin Hackett says yes. Would be great to engineer the pheromone pathways into plants and make facultative. Wonderful presentation. So more of a comment there. But I totally agree. Um, thank you so much for contributing. And um, as questions come in, if you wouldn't mind continuing to answer them um, sure. via the chat, via the Q and A. Um, all right. Well, and I also uh, wanted to say thank you to the attendees for asking questions. It always makes these a lot more fun and interactive when you do so. So keep those coming. Um, our last presentation uh, comes from Dr. Amanda Rowe. Um, she's a research scientist at the Canadian Forest Service. She's a scientific lead for the Insect and Quarantine Lab, and she chairs the Insect Rearing Advisory Group there. Um, her talk today is Host Plant and Environmental Structuring of Forest Tent Caterpillars Genomic Variation. And I just wanted to also mention that um, she's actually me calling in by phone. So hopefully we don't have technical difficulties. Um, but if we do, we may have to find a different way to answer questions, but continue to keep those questions coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank Lindsay for the invitation to come present on some of the work that I've been doing with colleagues at the University of Alberta on the forest and caterpillar. So the boreal and hardwood forests support a large number of economically for, uh, important forest pests. Uh, these are native species that experience eruptive population cycles and they're really found throughout the continent. Now, the native pests are widespread and exposed to a wide range of host plants as well as conditions throughout their range. Now, many of these experience complex outbreak patterns that require active management, but cannot be fully explained based on our knowledge of the species uh, right now, and that the, these outbreak patterns may vary on the landscape. And so one of the questions is, why do we see these uh, variable responses of these widespread pests to these different uh, regional uh, climates and conditions? And so this is why we decided to try and use a genomic approach to start understanding some of the finer scale differences among these uh, 
within these pest complexes or these pests and to try and delineate some of this genomic variation to help us understand functional variation that we're observing. And so we have a couple examples of where this has been done very effectively. So Lisa Lumley in 2020 published a, uh, a population genomic survey of the spruce budworm, the eastern spruce budworm, Kristen Eurofumiferana, and she demonstrated that this widespread species that has a continent-wide distribution actually has distinct, uh, three distinct populations across its distribution. There's an eastern population, a central population, and then a Beringian population in the Yukon and Alaska. And then knowing this structure, we were able to then look at these different populations to quantify some of these functional differences that may exist among them. And we were able to demonstrate that spruce bottom populations differ significantly in both their overall cold hardiness, as well as their ability to respond plastically to the temperature conditions that they're exposed to. Now, this may explain why we see greater survival in the far northern uh, populations than we would expect based on the functional traits that have been estimated uh, for more southern populations. Similarly, another a similar approach has been taken with the mountain pine beetle, another widespread pest, but one that has seen recent rapid expansion of its population into new and naive uh, forest in the, the boreal forest east of the Rocky Mountains. And both the neutral and adaptive markers have shown significant population structure, particularly with that expanding population. And that may explain how this beetle has been able to survive in areas where it's historically not been problem or never been detected. So these two examples clearly show why it's important to describe genomic variability among these really widespread species. And it really can provide crucial insight into their survival and spread into new habitats. And then by extension, improve our ability to help predict where they're going to survive and then manage those populations if they reach outbreak status. So here, I want to talk about the forest tent caterpillar, or Malacosoma dristria. So this is a very well-recognizable species found throughout North America, um, and they feed on a wide range of plants. But what's really interesting is that these, uh, this large recognizable caterpillar, um, they have uh, they have a really distinct life cycle, and they reach very large numbers. So the larvae emerge from their egg masses in the spring, and then that's when they feed on the newly emerging leaves of their host plants. The, the synchrony between these larvae and their host plants are critical for their survival, and they're very closely tied to that, that early spring flush of their host plants. So the FTC, the forest and caterpillar, they are within their eggs, and when they emerge, they are all um, they they form these aggregations. They're quite gregarious, and they stay together in this family unit, and they will travel up into the canopy to forage, and then they end up returning back to uh, the trunk of the tree where they'll actually spin a silken mat, and they'll sleep all together as a family unit at night. Unlike their name, they actually don't make tents, they just sort of make a little like, silken hammock. And it's and this gregarious behavior is actually really critical to their survival. And even when we're rearing them in the lab, we actually have to maintain that family group to be to, to ensure high survival. Now, when the general public notices them is usually when their populations reach the, this sort of eruptive level of this outbreak level. And these population cycles between uh, very high numbers and very low numbers is cyclical. Um, they experience outbreaks every 10 to 12 years. Now the outbreaks are quite spectacular um, because the larvae when they're fully mature are uh, a couple inches long with these really bright blue straight racing stripes and, and what look like little footprints along their back. And um, when they reach these really high numbers, a defoliation can be quite extensive and whole sections of the forest with uh, suitable host plants may be completely denuded. And 
they will move from a step from a, a defoliated stand to an undefoliated stand and those the, that movement uh, when the population numbers are high can can cause accidents on roads when vehicles uh, drive over them and they can they can literally cover every surface of the forest now this defoliation occurs on a really wide uh, in wide areas and so it is about this time the media starts to pay attention and we end up getting I'll end up getting phone calls about it for because people want to know about all the caterpillars. Now, the larvae, as I had mentioned before, have a really broad host range. They feed on a wide variety of hardwood host plants. So in our area, it's aspen and oak, uh, maple and birch. Um, but even throughout their range, because they have that North, Amer the North American wide distribution, the, the host plant can vary based on what's available within the area. So in southern, the southern US, they actually feed on things like water tupelo, um, and they can, they, they, they can be found on uh, prunus species, so it's a really wide range of, of hosts. And because of their, their relationship with the hosts and, and their, their high population, uh, their population dynamics, uh, they have been studied uh, by a number of people, particularly looking at regional functional variation among the populations. And this, uh, some really critical work um, has been done by Dylan Perry. And Dylan showed that northern populations of forest head caterpillar show um, there's actually a latitudinal decline in clup size. So what that means is that um, females in the north will lay fewer eggs, but the eggs that they do lay are larger. So that the northern larvae, when they emerge, are actually larger than ones in the south. And this means that that clutch size really is negatively correlated with latitude. And the authors hypothesize that these differences were due to uh, selection for overwintering survival, so that the, those larger larvae actually have a greater chance of surviving in the spring when they might be exposed to these uh, harsh uh, frost events or harsher spring conditions. And it gives them more uh, likelihood of, of, of surviving to be able to feed on those emerging leaves. Uh, Dylan also went, to, uh, went on to do a really interesting um, reciprocal transplant experiment looking at caterpillars from different areas and, and uh, change, uh, basically taking host and uh, doing a reciprocal transplant. So taking uh, larvae that are found on aspen and putting them on, on maple or oak and then doing the, the, the reverse. And what they showed is that larvae do better on the host that they were originally found on or their natal host than the alternate host, which led them to suggest that forest and caterpillar is not a single oligophagous species or, or a species with, with a bunch of uh, a single, a single oligophagous population. Rather, this may be a composite of regionally adapted populations. And so it was it was this that really um, inspired us to, to ask the question of whether we can see um, a, is there underlying genetic variation that defines these regionally adapted populations, and and if there is, then what are the biotic and abiotic factors that are responsible for restructuring that genomic variation within forest head category? So these factors could be uh, could. Could, could be a number of different things. So it may be that they are entirely structured by isolation by distance, isolation by resistance, or by isolation of environment or ecology. And for the isolation by ecology, we really focused on the question of whether host plant associated divergence was an important factor separating those populations. And we 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 hypothesize that, that there would be genomic variation based on the results that those reciprocal transplant experiments had shown um, by, that were conducted by Dylan Perry. So just to clarify what I mean by these different forms of isolation. So isolation by distance is basically states that ice, uh, things that are close together or populations that are close together are more similar. And those that are farther apart would be more distinct. 
and we, we use just a simple measure of Euclidean distance to define the, the distance between populations. Now, isolation by resistance is another form of distance measure, but what it uses is it assesses habitat suitability and it follows dispersal pathways through suitable habitat. So in this, uh, in this figure, you can see we have a habitat suitability ranging from zero to one, where one gives us in green, very suitable habitat, whereas the lighter, uh, the white or pink colors are more unsuitable. And so you would end up calculating distance through that more suitable habitat and not across unsuitable habitat. Another way of looking at structuring is looking for uh, environmental or ecological factors that may be correlated with genetic structure. This may help to identify areas that may be uh, appear populations experiencing local adaptation. And so knowing the biology of, of FTC, we identified uh, several traits or environmental traits that would be critical or maybe critical for helping to structure their population. So things like temperature, like the mean temperature of the warmest or the coldest month, the length of time um, that is cold or the length of time that we have uh, degree days that are uh, suitable for development, continentality, uh, extreme minimum temperatures in the winter, precipitation and that sort of the period where we do not experience frost. And then finally, we also have host. So as I said, we have a species that has a widespread uh, number of hosts, so it feeds on lots of different things. In the area that we're focusing on, we have four main hosts that we're going to focus on. Uh, we have trembling aspen, red oak, sugar maple, and white birch. And the idea is that we, we want to see whether the host that the, the egg mass or the young larvae are found on, are is that a good predictor of the genetic variation that exists within the species? And the idea is that if you have a host plant specialization, you may there may be underlying genetic differences that really underlie that specialization. But the problem with host plant specialization, it can be very difficult to tease that apart from those geographic or environmental factors also contributing to the structuring within the genome. And this is where we use a landscape genomic approach as a way of partitioning that variation to um, identify its contributions to genomic variation within the species. So we focus in this area of Ontario and uh, Quebec, where we have uh, overlapping host ranges of these four species of, of host plant. And so you can see um, in, in the top left-hand corner here, this is actually an egg mass with some of the early instar larvae emerging. So this, is, this species is actually really interesting because the females lay a single egg mass. And so the choice of, of location is actually really important to that female's downstream reproductive success and fitness. And so if she chooses to lay on a suitable host, the first host that those larvae are exposed to be one that, that would be suitable for them. And so by looking at overposition site and, and sampling egg masses, we actually get a sense of, uh, of the, the female's choice. So in this area, we had uh, sample 20 populations, which we see here in uh, the blue dots. The open circles are all of the uh, GBIF records that we had uh, reported of forest and caterpillar uh, based on museum collections. So you can see that where we're collecting is where you generally would find uh, forest and caterpillar within the region. So in these different sites, we had different types of forest stands. So we sampled individuals entirely off of trembling aspens. We had nine sites in the green circles with trembling aspens. We had four sugar maple sites. We had a red oak site and a white birch site, but then we also had mixed stands. So stands where you had both aspen and maple together or aspen, maple, and oak. And the nice thing with these mixed bands is it helps to remove that spatial component and narrow down the number of factors that may be structuring uh, the genetic variation within the species. 
So in total, we had 149 larvae samples from Ontario come back from their uh, known hosts or that overposition site. Uh, we did DNA extraction and library preparation for, and then used a genotyping by sequencing approach to get 158 million reads that we then aligned to a, a preliminary 10x genome for forested caterpillar. Uh, we made sure to filter for siblings, and given the biology of the species, it was really important to make sure that no siblings uh, were accidentally included. And then we ended up with a final data set of just over 3,000 SNPs for 104 individuals. So we used a number of different approaches to try and partition that genomic variation and to look for signatures of, of adaptive selection. Today, I'm just going to focus on the landscape genomic approach, and uh, we're not really going to touch on the, um, the outlier analysis. And so to start, um, on the left, we have a, uh, a PCA of all of our sites. And so you can see in the three, the four different colors, we have our red oak, maple, aspen, and birch. And Based on the PCA, we really don't see a discrete structuring by host. And you can really see that reflected in the structure analysis and the bar chart that's along the bottom. Um, and so we, we don't see distinct um, clusters based on that host plant. However, when you use a DAPC with those a priori host groups assembled, you do see that there is maybe some evidence of those um, hosts pulling apart. And so, because we don't see some, this really discrete structuring, um, the question is, is this merely due to correlations with distance and environmental isolation, or does host still have some impact on structuring the genomic variation that we just can't see with these sort of traditional population genomic anal analytical approaches? So this is where we introduced some tools that were used effectively within landscape genomics. And one of the one of the key ones is what's called reciprocal causal modeling. And so what you do is you're comparing a matrix of genomic variation to these other focal variables. And so what you're doing is you're comparing one variable, the focal variable, to an alternative. So at the top, we have Euclidean distance, which is our measure of isolation by distance. And you compare it to something like host association. And you ask the question, is Euclidean distance a better predictor of, genomic, of the genomic variation that we observe in the forest of caterpillar than host association? And what this is, is a series of Mantell tests. And you read this in the horizontal rows and so if a horizontal row or a box is red or redder then the redder suggests a higher correlation of that variable compared with the alternate variable and so you want to look for horizontal rows which are showing greater amount of red so we then also layered on a redundancy analysis to, to verify the, the, the results that we're seeing with this reciprocal causal model. And so the top explanatory variable within our data set was in fact host association. And this was also significant within the redundancy analysis. So this suggests that despite the, the, the lack of discrete structure in both our structure and PCA analysis, host association really does provide important structure to the genetic variation within this species. We also see that isolation by distance plays an important role. So things that are close together are more similar than things that are far apart. This again is also supported as significant under the redundancy analysis. We had two environmental variables that also came up as significant, both um, the mean temperature of the warmest month and the growing degree days. Again, so these are both significant on, in the RDA. And so what's going on? So what we think is that the variation with, that, is, that is being observed within this uh, species is not, a, is not discrete. It doesn't form discrete structures, but host associated divergence is still the best predictor of genomic variation. And what, Moreover, it actually 
provides genomic evidence that supports the functional analysis on larval performance that has been conducted over the last uh, over the last several decades. And so this very this this helps to to support the claim from uh, Dylan uh, Dylan Perry that that the, this host really is an important factor driving the uh, variation and the regional adaptation of these forested caterpillar species or this for these forested caterpillar populations the the other thing that, that was important is the isolation by the environment so temperature seemed to be contributing an important uh, uh, selection pressure on uh, a variation uh, among these populations. Now, this kind of makes sense. Forested caterpillar, like other insects, are ectothermic organisms. And spring emergence is really critical to their survival. That's one of the most critical periods of time within their developmental, within development. The other thing that is really closely linked to temperature are their host plants. So spring phenology is very much linked with the spring temperature conditions. And so the timing of leaf, of leaf out, as well as emergence from uh, the egg mass are both tied to the same variable. And since, um, since both of those are tied, it would make sense that it, that it is a, maybe an extension of that host associated divergence. And we know that um, plant phenology is very much regionally adapted. And we do see evidence that there are host associated difference in the amount of heat needed to cue emergence. So things that are coming on early flushers, such as aspen, these are our populations that seem to emerge early, whereas late emergers on maple or oak are are are, uh, are most plant species that flush late are also have uh, forest head caterpillar populations that seem to be flushing later. And so this is additional evidence from the functional work that, that, that uh, cor uh, corroborates the, the uh, observations that we have here. And then finally, we know um, that, that isolation by distance is playing a role, that individuals that are close together are more similar than ones that are far apart. Forested caterpillars, especially the females, have somewhat limited dispersal abilities, although they can end up being blown um, through uh, long distances under, uh, under uh, specific conditions, uh, such as uh, cold fronts, uh, and that, that, that does occur. However, we also see that there is um, potential evi there is evidence of population divergence on a much more continental scale. And so what we did is after taking this regional approach, we had uh, also collected some individuals from Alberta and Saskatchewan. So these are individuals that will be in the orange cloud um, in, in, in the West. And we wanted to basically try to put our genetic work into a larger context. And so there was uh, a, an analysis of mitochondrial genetic variation with, uh, within Melanchism Industria by Leighton Bear in 2018. And so we also collected mitochondrial variation for all the material that we had collected both in our regional study as well as in Alberta and Saskatchewan. We wanted to place that into that larger context. And using the same uh, molecular markers, we were able to show that there is in fact uh, a clear, there is a break between the uh, populations in Alberta and Saskatchewan and the uh, eastern populations that we sampled for those distinct host plants. We see um, that, again, that, that host really doesn't seem to be driving this. So you can see that uh, forested caterpillar larvae that were collected off of aspen, so that's the purple dots, um, those, uh, the, those don't form a single cluster and, in fact, uh, geography or the, the, the biogeographical location does really seem to separate these two populations. Now, one of the things that I do need to point out is that there is a, a, a gap between the sample that we had in Alberta uh, in Saskatchewan and then our sampling in Ontario and Quebec. And so it may be that we're missing some really critical populations in between, uh, say in Manitoba and the central prairies. 
and that, that this may in fact be a client in genetic diversity rather than discrete. And really, this is where more, more sampling is necessary. But then given that we're seeing this, this sort of discrete break, we ask whether we see something similar in mitochondrial DNA, and, and in fact, we don't. So mitochondrial DNA in the central, those orange clouds, uh, that the orange sampling sites and the green sampling sites really are, are mixed. And so we see shared haplotypes between these two regions. The one region that still sticks out and, and was identified as being distinct in late and there is the uh, populations west of the Rocky Mountains. And so it suggests that maybe there's more going on in this widespread species than we have fully captured with, uh, with our sample. Now, the really interesting thing is that if you look at the host plant, so this is a, a map of the genomic structure of um, trembling aspen. And so this is popular tremuloides that was published by Gosen et al. in 2022. And we see that um, just like we see that discrete break between the east and the central populations, we see the same thing in the host plant. So there's a similarity in the host plant and the forest tip caterpillar. And that may reflect a shared biogeographic history. But again, this is preliminary work and we hope to, we're planning on doing some larger continental surveys to be able to uh, dig into this a bit further. So just to sort of summarize that this work that we have done is we've been able to demonstrate that forest and caterpillar is not a single oligophagous species. There are in fact, uh, host plant seems to structure genomic variation, but that isolation by distance and environment are also contributing to this genomic structure. So there are multiple contributing factors to the, um, to the, the overall genetic structure within the species. And the work that we were that we've done actually really aligns well with the results that we have align well with the work on the functional life history traits that suggest that these are in fact regionally adapted populations. We also see evidence of larger biogeographic structure at the continental level, um, but this needs additional work because this is such a widespread species. Additional sampling is necessary. But the really important part that I want to hit home here is that as a pest, this, is, this species is often treated as uniform or homogeneous across its range. And what we've shown here is that is not necessarily the case. And that as you're making management decisions or trying to model population dynamics in the species, you can't assume that a population on one host in a different area than another is going to behave the same. And so you really need to avoid comparing apples and oranges. And we need to have a much better sense of the underlying complexity of those popu that population structure if we're going to understand the, the, the biology and the complexity of this uh, forest pest. And so by, by looking at this, uh, this genomic variation in forest tent caterpillar, as well as other forest pests, it provides clues into the biotic and abiotic forces that really help shape pest populations and may help us understand what's driving those population dynamics. And it provides a better understanding of the functional variation that really helps to influence where they survive and then how those outbreaks may behave. This is really critical as we move into changing uh, climatic regimes and that these, these native species that we thought we understood may change in unpredictable ways if we don't take this, this um, nuanced approach to understanding their, uh, the underlying variation within these widespread species. So as I said, we really are at the tip of the, we're really at the start of the work on the species. There's a lot of unsampled populations and hosts. So the West is unsampled, the South is unsampled, and there's lots of hosts that haven't been included. So water tupelo is a really interesting species that these uh, experience outbreak on down in the, in, in the US South. It would really help if we were able to get a chromosomal assembly for this species. And we'd like to then pair that with uh, genomic whole genome sequencing of museum material because there's a lot of material that's contained within our museum collections that could really help us gain an understanding of the species and develop that continental-wide uh, survey that, that is necessary. 
And so with that, I'm really happy to uh, have had the opportunity to talk and I'd like to acknowledge both the field assistance that we received in the work in this work as well as the lab assistance. Without these people, the work wouldn't have been possible, as well as our uh, various funding agencies. And so with that, I'd like to open up uh, uh, take any questions. Hi Lindsay, I'm here. Okay, good. We were, I was worried this wasn't going to work, but Amanda is here. Uh, she called in and we have several questions for you, Amanda. Um, great job on the presentation, by the way. Thank um, you. Okay. Yeah. Our first question is, how much is known about the nutritional differences of the host plants? So that's actually a great question and that's a really critical component. Um, we know that um, there's quite a difference between a lot of these different species of trees. Um, uh, and we know that even within uh, within a genus, so maple, for example, horse pet caterpillar can actually feed well on uh, say sugar maple, but it absolutely cannot feed on red maple. They avoid it, and so you can see like a stand that's completely defoliated, and you'll have this beautiful red maple fully at least in the middle of the stand. And so um, host uh, host compounds and the compounds in the leaves are really critical and it, it even varies um, within the tree. So uh, caterpillars that are feeding on uh, leaves that are sun exposed or shade exposed are experiencing sort of different uh, chemical uh, compounds and, and they can really tune their, their feeding based on, on those locations. And so there are a lot of uh, very, there's a lot of variation among uh, within species, among species, and that certainly is a strong force for selection for differences uh, in sort of regional host adaptation. Okay, okay cool. Thank you. Um, another question we got is, um, did you also analyze the epigenetic patterns such as DNA methylation? Uh, these gene expression regulation systems are impacted by the environment? You not at all at like we okay. no and and that is a that is a really interesting untapped avenue to look at because those females they they have that single egg mass and so they are making a single choice when they're ovipositing they only lay once and so there there's sort of two components when you start thinking about um about host and its interaction with uh with insects because there's preference, and that's where the female is choosing to lay her egg mass, and then there's larval performance. A lot of work has been done on larval performance, but very little has been done looking at what that female preference is, and do we see similarity among where the female is choosing to lay her eggs and how well those larvae perform, or is there a disjunct between those two things? And it's really interesting when you are in mixed stands to where you're seeing multiple uh, host plants mixed within a single stand. And so the female could be making a choice based on her preference that is actually contrary to the, the performance abilities of both larvae. And so looking at that both from a functional perspective, but then also starting to ask those questions from an epigenetic perspective would provide a really, really interesting insight to, to how, uh, how these insects live and feed on the landscape. And then maybe how these different um, adaptations may have evolved over time uh, to, to these, this wide range of species that it's feeding on. Okay, cool. Yeah, speaking of larval preference, it reminded me, I just this is kind of a curiosity question. Do you know what keeps those larvae as um, family units or why they do so, worse when they're not together? So they, there's like, oh, the behavior of these things, like they're such a fun group to work on because they lay down these silken pheromone trails and you'll have one caterpillar that ends up as a leader and everybody else sort of follows along behind. And their ability to lay down that silk and then follow those silk trails becomes really important. And the choices of the, the leader ends up becoming important too, because they're the ones who's leading everybody to where they're gonna feed and then they come back again. And so hmm. there's been a lot of work done on this group by Emma Desplat, who's at Concordia University in Canada. And she's done a lot of behavioral work on that 
um, that social behavior, that, that aggregation behavior, and it's important in how these insects live and survive in the forest. Yeah, that's really cool. Have they looked at ways to control them based on like removing the pheromone or doing something to break up those groups of larvae? Yeah, well, so forest pet caterpillar, it's an interesting system because like, they are a native to these cyclical population outbreaks, but there's a large community of parasitoids and um, uh, pathogens that, that really help keep those populations regulated, at least under our current sort of environmental climate. And so the populations are only ever really big for a couple years, so for two to three years, and then they crash and they're gone for 10 to 12 years. And so given the cost of a full-scale management program at a landscape level, it's actually easier just to let them outbreak and then crash naturally rather than trying to do uh, sort of prescriptive, like a prescriptive spray with BT or, or something else, because they have that, that built-in community. And by just, you would worry about disrupting the, the, the natural enemies and the natural enemy community um, in, in, a, in a system like this. And the thing is, is that other than the, the potential impacts that happen in the managed forest, our, like our forests are adapted to these species. And so like even, even with say aspen or a sand that gets completely defoliated, because it's the, the defoliation occurs really early in the spring, most of those trees are actually able to reflush and they can grow their leaves back. It's when you combine it with other impacts such as drought that you could see potential long-term impacts or losses uh, in the forest. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. All right, well, it's already five minutes past the hour, but I have one last question um, okay. and, then, and then we'll call it quits here. So do you find many or any fixed differences that could be used to define these different population groups or are there populations defined by local allele frequency differences? No, we don't really see clear fixed differences. And that was one of the challenges we've had trying to, to define these as discrete uh, populations. The, the exception of a caveat with that is that we do see fixed mitochondrial differences among populations that are on the west side of the Rocky Mountains. And so I would maybe just put a, I, I would put an asterisk next to that because we looked at sort of regional differences intensively and it's all, or only really starting to understand the larger population structure. Um, but for the host, and that link with the host, no, we really don't see clear fixed allelic differences that, that allow us to, to get to that. Now, that said, we haven't taken a whole genome resequencing approach with this species. This is GBS data. And so there may be small regions of the genome that are conferring, um, uh, that, that are linked with those host preferences or host performance data. And so this is where I think a, a, a more whole genome approach would probably provide us some further evidence uh, of, of the underlying genetic architecture of, of these sort of behavioral and functional traits. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Um, and if I could bring the other speakers back on, we'll just um, want to thank everyone for a really great session. Um, this was a really fun uh, group of talks, and I think, you know, based on all the attendee interest, uh, everyone really enjoyed them. So thank you so much, and thank you for the attendees for all the, the great questions uh, for conversation. Um, speakers and, um, and panelists, if you want to stick around for a few minutes, we can, we can talk here in a minute. All right, and thank Ron, you, everyone. And, oh, and lastly, thank you, Lindsay, and uh, also Glenn, yeah. Tia, uh, Anna, and uh, everybody else in the background. Uh, who did all the, the heavy lifting to help us along. So appreciate it, everybody. Thank you.